This is the sixth video on evolution. And in this video, we're gonna have a look at the second type of speciation, sympatric speciation. So as we said in the previous video, this type of speciation is a lot less common than allopatric speciation because there's no geographic um, isolation that occurs um, during this type of speciation. So it's a lot harder for two populations to become reproductively isolated. But of course, it can happen. So sympatric speciation is when a new species arises from an existing species, so from an ancestral species, in the same geographic area. So there's no geographic isolation. The new species can become isolated from the ancestral species because of, with respect to reproduction, so they'll become reproductively isolated as opposed to uh, geographically isolated, um, even if they do occur in the same area. So for allopatric speciation, the two populations will become Initially, they'll first be geographically isolated and then over time they'll become reproductively isolated. In sympatric speciation, they are only reproductively isolated. Sympatric speciation can occur as a result of the formation of polyploidy plants um, or hybrid species or other examples. These are just two of the examples. So this little diagram can, will kind of show the process of sympatric speciation where we have an original population then a polymorphism occurs, so a mutation occurs. Um, we then have reproductive isolation within this big population and eventually speciation occurs. So this little group of um, individuals becomes so genetically different from the original population that it eventually becomes a new species and is reproductively isolated from the original species. In plants, polyploidy can lead to the development of new species. So we spoke about polyploidy a little bit in the, um, I think it was the RNA video. It could possibly have been the, um, in fact, I think it was the meiosis video, but we can recap it here. Basically polyploidy is when there's a multiplication in the chromosome number. So not only just like one extra chromosome, but a whole extra set of chromosomes. So we know that humans have, um, or our body cells have a diploid number of chromosomes, that's 2N. But when plants are polyploid, they'll actually have 3N or 4N or 5N um, sets of chromosomes. So for uh, 3N, it becomes triploid, um, 4N is tetraploid, and so on. But the general name for it is polyploid. Um, this creates a new species in the same area as the original species because the original species, so the 2N, the diploid species, and this new species, which would be 3N, 4N, etc., they cannot crossbreed because the chromosome sets can't form matching homologous pairs. Because, for example, if we had a triploid plant um, trying to reproduce with a diploid plant, there would be an extra set of chromosomes that don't have a pair, and then, of course, they cannot produce fertile offspring. So they are reproductively isolated. We can also have the formation of hybrid species causing sympatric speciation through the breeding of unrelated individuals. Um, this can also lead to new species. If the hybrid species can reproduce and produce fertile offspring within themselves, within this little hybrid species, we say that it's a new species that's formed. This is very uncommon in the natural environment, obviously because the chances of two separate species reproducing and producing fertile offspring is very uncommon, but every now and then it does happen. Um, this new species formed through sympatric speciation is isolated from the ancestral species because it can't reproduce with the ancestral species and produce fertile offspring, but it sometimes can reproduce with itself, among itself, and produce fertile offspring, and will then call this a completely new hybrid species. Um, so an example of this is the golden crown mannequin, which actually has 20% of its genome coming from the snowy crown mannequin, which I think is this one. And the remaining 80% comes from the opal crown mannequin, one of these two. These would be the parents, and this would be the um, hybrid species that is actually formed originally from crossbreeding between these two species. However, none of these, neither of these two species can interbreed with each other anymore, but these golden crowned mannequins can interbreed within themselves and produce new species or produce fertile offspring, which means that we call it a new species. And it's sympatric speciation because there's been no geographic isolation.
Another example of this is the um, white ibis, scarlet ibis hybrid, um, which we call the Aruba Selena. I don't know if that's the country or the name of the bird, but this is the hybrid species over here coming from the white ibis and the scarlet ibis. And these, of course, are not part of the same species. One of the main examples for St. Patrick's speciation is the um, cyclidae fish. Um, this is quite often asked in papers and exams. So in Lake Malawi, um, we, there is fish that are called the cyclidae fish and they are of multiple different species. And they became this way through St. Patrick's speciation. They're some of the most diverse and specialized fish in the world. When we talk about specialized, we mean that they are very well adapted for their specific area and for their ecological niche. This is obviously very advantageous for them because they, in their current environment, they can um, interbreed very successfully, get food, mates, etc. But if we were to remove that niche, that little part of the environment, or if we were to change the ecosystem in some way, they might not be able to um, adapt fast enough because they're all so specialized and so genetically similar and they may then become extinct. So Lake Malawi is one of the lakes in the Great Rift in Africa and scientists believe that cichlids had one common ancestor that was introduced to the lake. So one species of fish originally went to Lake Malawi or was introduced somehow to Lake Malawi. It then evolved into more than 500 different species which are now reproductively isolated from each other. This happened, and um, we call it rapid, obviously it's not rapid as in like one or two generations, but rapid in comparison to how fast evolution usually occurs. This rapid speciation of cyclidae fish in Lake Malawi um, illustrates some patrick speciation because these new species originated in the same geographical area as the ancestral species. There was no geographic isolation. In the speciation of cichlids, there were three different stages of selection that scientists believe could be the reason for the rapid formation of the new cichlidae species. So within the one lake, Lake Malawi, the cichlids adapt to the following selective pressures, specific habitats. So that would be like the bottom of the lake, the top of the lake, near the lake edges, um, specific food types. So maybe other fish, um, fish eggs, the plants, the soil, bacteria, etc., and specific sexual strategies. Um, so this, this is just more a general discussion of reproductive isolation. But if we just look at the um, cichlids, one of the, the process that could occur for St. Patrick's speciation to happen would be that, of course, we had this um, one original ancestor introduced to the lake. The lake is obviously Lake Malawi is quite a large lake. And there were many different ecological niches that needed to be filled. So, for example, um, there were other fish that could be eaten. There was no competition. There were other fish that um, had eggs that needed to be eaten. There were a lot of plants that were growing almost out of control. There was no uh, competition to stop them. There was no natural predators that ate the plants, etc. And these, let's say, the fish that were originally introduced to the lake, for example, let's say that they all ate plants. They were all the algae or seaweed eating fish. They, that means that there's a lot of competition for this one type of food that they're eating, but there's very little competition for all the other food sources in the lake, the things like the other fish, the little uh, bits of dead stuff floating in the water, um, and so on. And so it's, if a fish had an adaptation that allowed them to eat other fish, they would have no competition, and so that would be quite advantageous for them. They'd be able to um, eat as much as they wanted without being um, competed for. So this is a beneficial mutation. They would live to sexual maturity, they'd reproduce, and they'd perhaps produce an offspring that can also eat fish. And over time, these little fish-eating cichlids developed into um, a population that now eats fish rather than plants, like the original ancestors. And over time, it becomes, these two populations will become separated from each other reproductively and as they um both reproduce within their own populations they become more and more genetically different and eventually we say that they are so reproductively isolated that they are completely new species and this of course happened not only with 
fish first, plant eating fish, but with a whole lot of different niches within that Lake Malawi that eventually caused them to be completely new, different species. And in the end, more than 500 different species in that one lake, starting from that one original ancestor species. So if we look at some mechanisms of reproductive isolation, reproductive isolation occurs by means of various isolating mechanisms that prevent population from exchanging genes or from crossbreeding. Reproductive isolation often follows allopatric speciation, as I said, um, because it's the final stage of speciation in population. So um, in allopatric speciation, we have this geographical barrier, um, we have speciation, and then we have reproductive isolation. However, in sympatric speciation, there is no geographical barrier. The two species will remain separate as there are mechanisms that prevent the gene flow between them. These mechanisms could be, in allopatric speciation, they could be the actual geographic barrier. However, they could also be um, something like behavioral patterns, physiological processes, or structural design that could occur in both allopatric and sympatric speciation and that prevent the two species from crossbreeding and producing viable offspring. So reproductively isolating mechanisms can be classified into two main groups. Reproductive isolating mechanisms are just the mechanisms that prevent two species from um, reproducing um, or from producing fertile offspring. The two main groups are prezygotic isolation and postzygotic isolation. So prezygotic isolation involves mechanisms that occur before fertilization occurs, so before the actual um, copulation process, or before the sperm literally fuses with the egg, and they either prevent the mating process or they prevent the fertilization process. An example of this is, of course, a geographic barrier because the species, the populations are so separate that they can't even meet to mate, let alone have fertilization and and um, produce offspring. We then have post-psychotic isolation, which means that um, fertilization could occur between two different species, but the zygote um, will develop abnormally, and it means that the offspring might not be viable, so it might not uh, live and survive, or it might not be fertile, so it might survive, but it can't reproduce itself. An example of this would be um, a donkey and a horse they can reproduce and they can produce offspring. However, this offspring is infertile. It can't reproduce itself. So we, we don't call this a, like a successful um, breeding. We, we don't consider donkeys and horses the same species because they can't produce fertile offspring. So some of the mechanisms of reproductive isolation include um, temporal or seasonal isolation. So this would be breeding at different times of the year or even just different times of the day. Um, one species may reproduce in spring and another in autumn and they then can't off they then can't crossbreed because they don't um, they don't mate at the same times of the year. Some species might produce gametes or spores or flowers at different time of the year which prevents reproductive possibility. Um, and of course it doesn't necessarily have to be different times of the year. It can be a much shorter time period, just different times of the day. So some animal populations are active at night, we call them nocturnal, and some are active during the day, diurnal. And animals that are active at night, animals that are active at day, obviously would not meet and reproduce because they are active at different times. Um, an example of this would be the amphibian species, uh, Rana, Rana aurora, which are sexually active um, from January to March, and Rana boili, which are sexually active from March to May. They um, don't, their breeding seasons don't really overlap. I know it says March and March, but we assume that they're two separate time periods. So there's no crossbreeding that can occur. Another example of reproductive isolation is behavioral isolation. So this would be um, species specific courtship. Um, of course, this is prezygotic because it happens before fertilization occurs. And as we said, breeding at different times of year is also prezygotic because fertilization has not occurred yet. So we said in the um, behavior animals video where that courtship is the behavioral patterns of male and female animals that indicate sexual maturity and eventually lead to mating, fertilization, and the production of offspring.
So if courtship is unsuccessful, then we don't have mating and we don't have fertilization. Courtship rituals are species specific and only individuals of the same species will recognize the, symbol, the signals and respond. This prevents crossbreeding, of course, because if the animals are from separate species, they will not recognize the courtship rituals of the original species and know that the species wants to mate. And so, of course, mating will not occur. Um, it also ensures that no energy and effort is wasted on a potential mate of a separate species because this is, of course, an unsuccessful or a waste of um, reproduction because the offspring is not fertile. And in the end, the goal of all organisms is to produce fertile offsprings to continue the species. Um, some of the examples of species-specific courtship would be the courtship rituals of dogs and wolves. They differ, um, so that prevents dogs and wolves from interbreeding. Um, flying displays of eagles um, differ between the eagles, mating calls of animals, mating dances by insects. The secretion of pheromones is quite an important one um, in insects and invertebrates. Obviously, the insects of different species cannot recognize um, the secretion of a pheromone by another species. Also, feather displays of birds and color changes that signal sexual maturity. Um, adaptations of plants to different pollinators is also another prezygotic isolation. We call this mechanical isolation. So flowers of various plant species have different adaptations, so it's different structure, maybe a different scent, different color, etc that makes them suitable for pollination by specific pollinators. So particular insects, bees, butterflies, birds, um, or by the wind. And this ensures that they only receive pollen from the same species. It prevents hybridization, which we talked about earlier, and it increases the chances of successful fertilization. Um, so some of the examples is a flower that is pollinated by the wind um, and is not adapted to insect pollinators can't crossbreed with an insect pollinator because the structures will not be in place and often because the insects will just not land on a plant that is pollinated by wind. Um, these are more examples of um, mechanical isolation, which you can just pause the video and read through yourself. They're mostly quite self-explanatory and they, they're often not asked um, as, a, as a content learning. They'll often be given as a, like an application question. So it's not, really worth learning all six of these. Um, the, the important thing to note about this is this is that these examples illustrate co-evolution. So interdependent organisms, that is organisms that depend on the same resources, live in the same areas, etc. They had to evolve simultaneously because they depend on each other for survival. Um, and we know that they have to both evolve similar adaptations but also adaptations that are different so that something like um, interbreeding with the wrong species doesn't occur.